And good evening, everyone. Welcome to this week's Book of Mormon Conversation. Uh, my name is Chris Eastland. I'm a board member of the John Widso Foundation, and we're pleased to be partnering with the Neil A. Maxwell Institute to sponsor these weekly discussions with each of the authors in the series of essays entitled The Book of Mormon Brief Theological Introductions. Our special guest tonight is Dr. David F. Holland, who wrote a thought-provoking volume covering the concluding chapters of the Book of Mormon, specifically the Book of Moroni. And since uh, this book is still in pre-publication, I'm one of the lucky few who've had the opportunity to read an advanced copy, and I'm very much looking forward to our discussion with David this evening and giving all of you a sneak preview of the insightful things that he covers in the book. Uh, Dr. Holland is the John Bartlett Professor of New England Church History at Harvard Divinity School and the Director of Graduate Studies in Religion at Harvard University. He's the author of Sacred Borders, Continuing Revelation and Canonical Restraint in Early America, which was published by the Oxford University Press. Uh, for those of you who uh, are not uh, as familiar, the John A. Witso Foundation is dedicated to providing Latter-day Saint scholars a forum and resources to produce world-class, academically rigorous, and innovative scholarship on issues of significance to both Latter-day Saints and the global religious community, and also to creating stronger cooperative relationships between members of diverse faith traditions while advancing the cause of gospel-centered principles. Uh, David and I are looking forward to our conversation, and we invite each of you to respectfully participate in the discussion via the chat feature, which you'll find on the right-hand side of your screen. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, please use the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can also vote for your favorite questions that have been asked already. We'll do our best to answer as many audience questions as we can during the second half of the, dis of the discussion. Uh, additionally, the session will be recorded and will be available to view later this week. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and jump in. And David, thank you for being with us tonight. I appreciate uh, you first taking the time and effort to write this volume to give it the, the thought that it uh, requires. It's, it's meaty material, even though it's relatively short in terms of total volume, uh, there's a lot to think about. And I'm hoping that maybe we can start by having you put Moroni's circumstances into context for us. He lived in a period of real uncertainty personally. Uh, what lessons can we take from Moroni's lived experience in particular the changes that we observe sort of from his beginning writing where he seems sort of despondent until uh, the end of his writings where he seems much more uh, triumphant. And as we strive to live lives of faith in, in a time of uncertainty ourselves. Thank you. I think Moroni's personal context is really quite critical for understanding the content of his book. Moroni is the product of trauma. There's really only one other Book of Mormon author who I think compares to him in that regard, and that is Jacob. They both are functioning in the shadow, so to speak, of major prophetic figures who precede them. In Jacob's case, his older brother Nephi, in Moroni's case, his father Mormon. And they're both handed this remarkable responsibility to carry on with a cause that has been begun by their predecessor. I think that combination of trauma and the weighty responsibility inherited from those who came before them lends both of those prophets a degree of personal insecurity that comes through in their writing. If you think about the title page of the Book of Mormon, I'm among those, I think, I think the majority of interpreters are, who believe that Moroni is the author of the title page. He begins by talking about the gifts of God, that this book is provided by the gifts of God and that it will be interpreted by the gifts of God. And then at the end he says, and please don't, uh, please don't condemn it because the human authors may not have been perfect. That same message appears at the end of the Book of Mormon, that is the internal Book of Mormon, his father's book, which Moroni concludes, he says the same thing. He talks in Mormon 9 about the gifts of God and the imperfections of human authors. He says the same thing at the end of Ether when he concludes the Book of Ether. In Ether 12, in verse 8, he talks about the gifts of God, and then famously in verse 27, he talks about weakness and the imperfection and the fact that God has these compensatory blessings and gifts that will help make up for that. 
It's one of the uh, kind of remarkable authorial signatures in the Book of Mormon that everywhere Moroni appears, this combination appears. You know, the personal imperfection of prophetic figures and the power of God's ability to gift us his capacity. And uh, the, that signature is not distinctive to the Book of Moroni, but it is distinctive to the author Moroni. Uh, and it's quite comparable, again, I think, to Jacob in slightly different wording uh, and when they shared similar kinds of circumstances. So that's just a long way of saying that Moroni's personal history and his personal context and who he is in the lineage of prophetic figures and where he is in the history of the Nephite civilization help shape the content and even the theology that he's providing that is rife with a kind of personal uncertainty about his capacity to complete this work with the degree of perfection that he would like, but also this high degree of conviction that God has the capacity to work through imperfect vessels. Uh, it is kind of Moroni's late motif, and I think it has to do with both the trauma he experienced prior to writing the book and the isolation and difficulties facing it at the time of composition. It's striking to me that isolation uh, is, uh, is in really remarkable contrast to his preoccupation with the ordinances and the functioning of a well-ordered community. Uh, almost immediately after he describes his, uh, his uncertain situation, he begins to talk about conferring the gift of the Holy Ghost uh, and, um, and why uh, it's important for that conferral of the Holy Ghost to be according to the pattern that the Savior had set. He then talks about ordaining priests and teachers, then gives us the language of the sacrament prayers. And I think that's precisely because he's living in a time of chaos. He's living in a time of disorder. And sort of in the same way that starving people dream of feasts, here's this isolated person living in a time of anarchy, dreaming of the well-ordered church, the well-ordered community. And so the fact that that's the foundation upon which he'll layer his subsequent theology, I think says a lot about his particular moment in time, his circumstances uh, at the moment when the civilization is collapsing and how desperately he's yearning for the order and stability of former times. Yeah, that's super helpful. Um, you mentioned that there are a variety of gifts that Moroni talks about. That's one of the themes that runs through your volume. Uh, I think there's another theme, which is the various relationships that Moroni has with different individuals or groups of individuals that he doesn't experience in the first person, right? There's the relationship with his father from whom he's now been separated. There's the relationship with the Lamanites that he's trying to avoid. There's his relationship with the future disciples of Christ that he sees but doesn't know personally. Help us understand how these relationships inform the content and the structure of Moroni's book, because there are lots of different pieces that he pulls together that are sort of based on these relationships and how they interplay with the different gifts that God gives. Thank you. Uh, Moroni, notwithstanding his actual physical isolation, continually conceives of himself as part of various communities. As you've noted, the book is addressed to Lamanites. It's one of the often overlooked facts of the book of Moroni, that he says, I'm writing this for the Lamanites. It's a pretty remarkable moment in the book where uh, Moroni uh, is literally on the run from the very people to whom he's addressing this volume. It's, it's, it's one of those sort of paradoxical moments of complexity that makes the book so rich and I think it's a testament to Moroni's conviction that the gifts of God do ultimately prevail, though their timing may not match our own uh, impatience. Moroni is saying at some point, he says in the opening chapter, you know, this, this, this will work at some point. I believe this is going to work eventually. Right now, I may be on the run roving death squads. But eventually, this testimony is going to find its audience. And it's going to find its audience among the Lamanite people, his kin. He clearly sees them as his brethren, and he wants those familial bonds to be restored, 
well aware that they're not going to be restored in his lifetime, but that maybe this testimony might live on to forge the connection that had been broken by Nephite atrocity and brutality. So here he is, a figure who is, the, the Lamanites have no reason to trust this Nephite figure. They have no interest in the message because it's associated with the brutalities and injustices that his father describes in what we have as Moroni 9. And yet he's got all of this hope that that relationship will be healed, uh, that this uh, fissure among Lehi's family is not forever, but that the promise of eternity is that there will be a reproachment, there will be a reconnection. And he's writing with that end in mind. So he's part of that community, he's part of that family of Lehi. And he's determined to live that truth, even though in his own lifetime he knows it will not come to fruition. He's also writing, he sometimes writes in, uh, in the first person plural, we. He uses the kind of plural pl pronoun, we and us, to describe the other authors of the Book of Mormon. So he sees himself as part of this community of testifiers. Even though he's as isolated as a person can be, he's projected or constructed this community of fellow authors with whom he's traveled. And so I think that's part of what accounts for his sort of repeated apologies for his own imperfection, is he feels the weight of those communal expectations that I think he knows he'll be the culminating author of this record. And he feels a sense of obligation to the other members of that authorial community. And that drives him to a certain uh, kind of approach to his book, one that makes a lot of room for the words of other people. He, you know, he's, most of the words in this book are from other people. They're not from Rona, which I think is a, pretty quickly moves into. Yeah, I, th I think that's very much in keeping with his personality. If you know, when he first shows up to talk to Joseph Smith, he shows up and starts quoting a bunch of other prophets. So both in his mortal life and posthumously, again, this consistency that we see every time he pops up in the Book of Mormon, we see this personality quirk. But again, when he pops up in the early days of the Restoration, we see the same personality quirk. So he shares, you know, what Jesus says to the disciples, what the disciples say when ordaining teachers and priests, what the priests say when they're praying over the emblems of the sacrament, what his father says in the sermon on faith, hope, and charity, what his father writes in a letter about infant baptism, and then what he writes in a description of the destruction of Nephite civilization. Most of the book is Moroni gathering the words from others with, with whom he feels this sense of shared connection and this kind of deference that Moroni uh, exemplifies to provide us with other people's words, I think suggests his kind of communitarian impulse. This is not Moroni's show. He's not seeking the spotlight here in conclusion. He's still gathering. He's still bringing a kind of cohering force to these disparate materials and that's the role that I think he conceives of for himself because he's communally minded. Yeah. And you noted that he, he jumps pretty quickly to a discussion about the specific wording in the ordinances that were instituted by Christ, but that really we didn't get direct insight into from the other words of, of Mormon earlier in the Book of Mormon. And that there's this connection that he draws and that, and that you draw from the description of these ordinances, particularly of the sacrament and the regular performance of that ordinance to the process of becoming something that he probably didn't have the opportunity to do to partake of the sacrament on a regular basis. And yet he looks forward to our time to see when that would be possible and would be necessary. Talk a little bit about that relationship between the weekly or the repetitive performance and how that impacts us as individuals. Thank you. Uh, you know, there was a, a great deal of debate early in the history of the church about how frequently we should observe the sacrament. We've come to accept it as a weekly occurrence, but the early saints didn't always understand it that way. Um, and partly that's because they were a product of their own time and place. Other Protestant groups uh, in the mid 19th century United States had much less frequent observances of, uh, of communion or the Lord's Supper uh, as part of their weekly or part of their uh, liturgy. Um, and so 
Moroni's concluding kind of description of the church meeting together oft to partake of the sacrament has had a, a, a major impact on our cultures. The saints ultimately came around to that uh, Moroni description, and in fact, it's reiterated in a revelation in the book of, in the uh, Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, and uh, if you uh, read, for instance, uh, Jonathan Stapley's uh, recent book on Latter-day Saint liturgy, he, he's, he credits Moroni as shaping our uh, commitment to this weekly sacrament that ultimately the saints, when they are called to take the Book of Mormon seriously, recognize that Moroni had something to say about the frequency of this ordinance. So what is it about that kind of repetitive recurrence and the preservation of the language of the sacrament that seems so important to Moroni. Well, for one thing, Moroni is very committed to the idea of connection across generations or connection across time. If you think about the two great divisions of God's family, we think of lots of other uh, sort of second order divisions, race and class and gender and geography. Um, the, those uh, are, uh, are quite important, but the kind of major barrier uh, of uh, of separation, for separation of God's family is time. Uh, that some of his children are born in one time and some of us are born in another time. Uh, and we cannot, in, however well intended, we cannot scale that obstacle. We cannot get over it. But the Lord and his goodness and his desire to unite his family has provided ways across the barriers of time. Uh, the temple being the most magnificent example of that, where we walk in and we do work and express love for people who lived in other times in ways that we would otherwise be completely unable to do. But an ordinance like the sacrament serves something of the same function. When we hear those prayers and, and we protect them with a kind of uh, fastidiousness that is quite unique in our culture, we're, we're not usually big on, uh, on memorized prayers, but when it comes to the sacrament, we are carefully monitoring and policing each word in that prayer to the point that we'll repeat it over and over and over again until we get it right. Why do we do that? Well, in part because it is an opportunity to break through that barrier of time that separates the family of God. When I hear those prayers, I am with ancient Lamanites again. I am with ancient Nephites again, hearing the prayers as they were described by the Savior himself and then 400 years later recorded by Moroni. The emblems themselves, when I eat a crust of bread, I'm eating the same thing that the apostles ate anciently in the upper room with the Savior himself. That on a Sunday morning, I come into my worship space and I bridge this chronological gap and I have sisters and I have brothers with whom I am separated by the barriers of time, but the ordinance breaks through those by maintaining its consistency and resisting historical change. So that's part of, of why we sort of fastidiously take care of, of, of the details of this ordinance. But the frequency plays a, a particular role in what we sometimes refer to as uh, self-formation or what Aristotle called the habitus or what sometimes philosophers refer to as virtue ethics, which is that in the doing of something, we are um, recreated through the frequency of a habituated practice. Uh, it used to be that that uh, deep it, we assumed, as kind of philosophers of religion, that our ordinances were an expression of who we were. Uh, but a lot of more recent theological uh, discussion, going back to some of these ancient classical philosophical commitments, suggests that our belief is a product of what we do, uh, and that by going through the processes of renewing covenants week after week after week, of taking that crust of bread, of taking that sip of water, that we are habituated as a covenant making and keeping people, that we um, build our, uh, our Christ-like characteristics through this kind of spiritual muscle memory. The analogy that I use in the book is it's, it's like a pianist you know, doing scales, right? The scales, create a kind of habit of ability that turns a, you know, an amateur into a, 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 a professional pianist. Now, that's not the entirety of it. The, 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 uh, scales do not a concerto make, 
but they're part of that process and the sacrament, the ordinance, the weakliness of it, the frequency of it is part of that message that as we consistently and with discipline keep coming back again and again to that altar, that we are gradually, painstakingly, week by week, becoming transformed into the expression of the very covenants that we seek to, uh, to make in that ordinance. Uh, and the third point to make is that in the frequency, there's a message about God's magnanimity. Uh, you know, the average Latter-day Saint who's baptized at eight and lives to 80 will take the sacrament some 4,000 times. Uh, if we do it weekly, uh, and uh, and that is a message about God's uh, generosity. If we think about that promise of renewal and that promise of forgiveness, that four thousand times over the course of our life we get to go through that process, that in the frequency we learn something about the character of God, that He'll come back for us again and again and again. So breaking through time. The process of, you know, the creation of a covenant-keeping character through the repetitive disciplining of the ordinance and this message about God's largesse, his generosity, and allowing us to come to that altar despite our imperfection week after week after week. Those are powerful things that come in kind of the the simplest and most familiar of our ceremonies. Uh, it's, It's not bad for a Sunday morning to have all those messages converge on our congregations and in our hearts as participants in that ordinance. So that brings us to chapter seven. Let's jump in there. And in some ways, this is a a culmination of the very qualities that you talk about needing to develop where the sacrament and the process and the performance week after week, hopefully brings us to these characteristics of faith, hope, and, and charity. And one of the things that struck me is that you note that this noun, the, the concept of charity over the course of cha- chapter seven is described in conjunction with a s- progressive series of action words, of verbs that really imply sort of a tra- an upward trajectory in how we understand and ultimately obtain the kind of charitable love that Moroni and his father, uh, Mormon, are asking us or inviting us to interact with. Talk a little bit about those action verbs and and how they develop this concept of charity and what it means for us. Thank you. Uh, I do think there's there's a sort of sequencing to to Moroni's development here. He begins with the ordinances in chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, and at the very beginning of chapter 6. And once the kind of foundation of the ordinances is established, then he builds a community on top of that. The remainder of chapter six uh, is uh, is about the community that coalesces around these rituals. And then that community becomes the context in which his father, Mormon, provides this sermon. Uh, That is, you don't get to the sermon until you've kind of laid that... um, the foundation of the ordinance and the community builds upon it. And then the community helps us develop these virtues of faith and hope and love. Um, It's interesting to me that the, uh, the opening of that sermon in chapter seven from Mormon begins with this major philosophical riddle. Um, Mormon talks about how, uh, you know, a, a filthy a fountain cannot produce good water. A good fountain cannot produce filthy water. You know, a, a wicked man cannot pray because he'll pray with improper intent. And it creates this sort of cul-de-sac, right? If we're wicked, we cannot become good. Uh, and it, it, it leaves us a little bit despairing about any internal capacity to change ourselves. Well, it just so happens that midway through that chapter, after Mormons established this problem that, that what we might philosophically call a kind of determinism, uh, that we're sort of stuck in our own character, he then starts talking about miracles. You know, how miracles are the key to everything that, uh, that God has in store for us and that we have to believe in miracles if we're going to really believe in Jesus. And it's a little bit inexplicable why suddenly in this discussion about kind of hearts that need to change, we, su- we suddenly get this, 
discourse on miracles, except that I think what Mormon's talking about is that we all rely on a miracle to transform us. That the pure love of Christ, if it is our um, kind of prerequisite of exaltation, uh, that we have that kind of love within our hearts, that's not something that we can do for ourselves. However much I appreciate the transformative power of the sacrament, uh, no matter how many crusts of bread and sips of water I take, that's not going to quite get me from where I am to the pure love of Christ. And it's my capacity to love like he loves. It requires a, an atoning miracle uh, in between here and there. And that miracle rests on faith and it rests on hope. Uh, faith being, I think, in, in Mormon's description, I think across the Book of Mormon, faith being in the characteristics of God, that is that God is good. And hope being that those characteristics apply to me personally, that is that he'll be good to me. And then charity is this experience of having him be good through us. And it begins by being the recipients of that love. So uh, first he says we've got to have it. And I think partly that is uh, meant to uh, suggest that we've got to receive it. Uh, I'm just going to open here so that uh, I'm, I'm quoting this correctly. Um, to, uh, to Moroni 7, uh, when we think about these verbs that, you, that, you've, re that you've referenced. Um, Moroni says, you know, uh, that um, if he have not charity, he is nothing. Wherefore, he must needs have charity. Now, uh, it begins with this idea that we've, we've got to have it somehow, which I think suggests we've got to get it from somewhere which I believe is a suggestion that the pure love of Christ begins with Christ. It begins with the conferral of it upon us. Uh, and he wants us to possess it. He wants us to, to hold on to it. Uh, and then in 46, we don't just have it, we cleave unto it. That is, once it's been given to us, we hold on to it, the perseverance of the saints, that we're going to cleave and connect to it, which is a stronger verb, I think, than merely having. It is a kind of merging that we are becoming kind of sealed to it. Uh, and then it, he says uh, that if we are true followers of Christ, that is, I think, if we live, live those first two principles, which is to have it and to cleave to it, we will then be filled with it. And that is the kind of final step of this progression, because when we are filled with it, uh, it says, uh, then we shall become the sons of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So we receive it from him. We spend our lives trying to cleave unto it, hold on to it, live it in the exercise of our own miraculously endowed agency. And through those two steps, we become filled with it, which means it's, it's become part of us. We are ourselves now vessels of that love in a way that doesn't just transform us, but can be an actual source of that love into the lives of others. This is always the sort of dilemma about, you know, what does it mean to have the pure love of Christ, is it something that he gives us or is it something that we're supposed to express to others? And I think the lesson of Moroni 7 is that it's both. That when you get to that place that we're filled with it, we are both the recipients of it and the conduits of it. Uh, and that's the ultimate stage of our relationship to it. Uh, and that's when we can see him as he is because we have become like him through that encounter with love. So you see that kind of progression of the verbs, which I think gets stronger and stronger, have, cleave, be filled with. Um, and that's the, that's the trajectory that we're supposed to be on. And the ordinances are the starting point and the community is the practice place for these virtues. And ultimately it all rests on the atoning gifts of a savior who has exemplified that love well before us. Yeah. So that's great theology. Let me give you a hard question and kind of see how that theology interacts with sort of practical reality. Moroni has undoubtedly a complicated relationship with the Lamanites. He's simultaneously a refugee on the run and also a testifier of truth to his future Lamanite generations. How does his charity towards them inform the way that we might engage with those with whom we have disagreements or even conflict? You know, it reminds me a little bit of uh, the, the recurring messages in scripture that invite us to be not weary in well-doing. I've always sort of been bothered by those, uh, by those passages because it feels like an indictment 
because I, I feel weary quite frequently uh, in, in, in well-doing and weary in a lot of other things too. I've grown convinced, however, that the, the charge to be not weary in well-doing means don't give up, don't stop trying. It doesn't mean that in any particular case you, that your charity might feel weak, but that you're going to keep coming back again and again and again. It, it, it is in some ways comparable to that discussion that we just had about the sacrament, right? You come back to that altar, you come back, you come back. That's why I tell my children we go to church every Sunday morning, however much they may hear the same things and however much they may do the same things, that we're going to come back and try again. And we're going to come back and try again. And I think charity functions the same way. Uh, and here you have Moroni, who's worked on this problem, who's been uh, in this uh, sort of existential battle with his Lamanite uh, kin. And yet here he is at the very end of his life with his literally his last expression in mortality. He's still trying. He's still reaching out. Now, I wouldn't suggest that that Moroni is the perfect embodiment of charity. I think he would not suggest that. As I said, he's preoccupied with his own, uh, his own imperfection. And he says in, in Mormon 9 that we should give thanks for his imperfection, that we might, be, that we might learn to be more wise than he has been. And this, is a, this is a serious commitment for him. So I don't think he's presenting himself as the paragon of virtue, but what he is is a wonderful example of persistence. That after all is said and done, and all the reasons why he might lose hope that anything that he would ever say or write would have any meaning for this people with whom he's been locked in this ugly, brutal struggle, he still believes, and he's still going to try. And with his last dying breath, he's still going to offer himself up. And that, for me, is an example of charity never failing. Not that there aren't moments when... You know, Moroni's compassion probably wavered. It was pointed out to me actually by a local seminary teacher that the Moroni at the end of, uh, of Mormon is uh, a little bit harsh. Uh, and yet the, mm -hmm. the, the central factor of his own book is this promise of love uh, that, that Moroni himself is on a trajectory of growth from, you know, end of the Book of Mormon to end of the Book of Ether to his own book that you see this transformation. So I think that is a lesson in the persistence of discipleship. Uh, and charity doesn't fail, not because sometimes we don't feel it, but because we have the opportunity to return to it over and over again, endlessly. Uh, and that's what we see Moroni doing. Yeah. At the beginning of our discussion, you noted that Moroni's account really is filled with this concept of gifts all of which are ultimately intended to point us back towards the Savior. And he chooses to end his record with a discussion of a wide variety of spiritual gifts. Interesting that we find those not just in, in his record, but also in Paul's letters and then again in, in modern revelation through Joseph Smith. And he suggested it's our responsibility to both recognize from whence they come and also to accept the universality of these gifts throughout time. Of course, he most famously invites us to seek the gift of testimony, particularly the truthfulness of the record at the beginning of chapter 10. But what are some of the other important invitations to enjoy spiritual gifts that Moroni asks us to consider throughout his writings? He says here, I'm, I'm in chapter 10, his, uh, his, his final uh, testimony, the final chapter says you're familiar with this passage, but uh, to one is given, is given by the Spirit of God that he may teach the word of wisdom, uh, and to another that he may teach the word of knowledge, and to another exceedingly great faith, and to another the gifts of healing, and to another that he may work mighty miracles, and to another that he may prophesy, and to another the beholding of angels and the ministry spirits, and again to another all kinds of tongues. Goes on to talk about the interpretation of languages. So he, he, I, I think it, that's obviously not an exhaustive list. I mean, we can think of other spiritual gifts that he doesn't describe. I don't think he's trying to be absolutely comprehensive there. I think he's trying to give us an example of the diversity of those gifts. And so the first thing he seems to suggest is that there, there is a diversity of endowments across God's children. It's interesting to me, he doesn't talk about people in the church even, 
He's talking about the children of God. Generally, he says the children of men uh, in this passage. So even beyond our, our own covenanted community, uh, I think what Moroni is suggesting is that we find gifts of the Spirit among all those who look to the Lord. Uh, and, you know, you have the f- famous statements from the First Presidency that even some of the great founders of non-Christian traditions were endowed with the light of Christ and, and guidance of certain kinds of spiritual gifts. I think that's to suggest that we need each other. Right? We, we, the children of God need each other because none of us has all of the gifts and the gifts are dispersed variously among us. It's why we gather as a people within the church. It's what I miss in the pandemic. I used to have the opportunity to walk down the corridor of my church building and bump into somebody who had that gift of teaching with power or had the gift uh, of, uh, of great faith, the gifts that Moroni describes. And when I am with them, I am lifted and elevated by you know, the diversity of gifts, that nobody is an island, nobody is self-sufficient or self-contained. And so these gifts have been distributed variously. So you know, Moroni is talking about a great diversity of the human family and the ways in which each has been endowed with their own piece to bring to this grand puzzle. But he also, there's this great sort of counterpoise here, or, or this um, kind of anchor to that diversity, which is he, he harps on the fact that God is one, and God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that this pairing actually often occurs in discussions of spiritual gifts, not just in Moroni, but elsewhere. The, the, the stability and consistency and universality of our God and the diversity of those gifts to his children, it is this sort of complementary truth of what binds us universally and what makes us rich uh, diversely. Uh, and that if we deny either, any of those, right, if we say, you know, if we don't recognize the gifts that our sisters and brothers have been given because they are other than ours, then we are denying part of the beauty of God's work in the world. Or if we become so preoccupied with the diversity of those gifts and the particularity of their distribution that we forget that we all share the same source, then that too denies us one of the great beauties of the divine plan and divine message. But it's actually the convergence of these um, kind of countervailing truths that the full richness of our Father's work in the world is revealed. The unitary, universal, consistent character of a God who loves us and the fact that he's distributed his gifts broadly so that his children might link with one another, lean on one another, learn from one another in the way that any good parent wants his children to interact with each other. So that combination of diversity and unity among the children of our Heavenly Father is one of Moroni's concluding statements in his culminating testimony. Yeah. I want to jump into a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, let's take the following one. I skipped over a lot of the interesting stuff in Moroni chapter eight. And one of our listeners asks, I've always been interested in Mormon's letter about child baptism and its timing relating to world philosophy. It seems like it coincides with St. Augustine's writings about total depravity of man, even of babes from the time of conception as if while the worst doctrines of apostasy are spreading, God must look for a prophet somewhere to counteract that. Is there anything to this, or am I stretching too far? Uh, well, I, th- I think there is something to it. I mean, I, I, Mormon is clearly preoccupied with the specifics of this heresy, as he understands it. Um, and he's, he's frustrated that within his own community, um, he, uh, he sees this idea developing and he worries about what it means about the character of God. I mean, r- remember that this whole theology that the book of Moroni is developing depends on the character of God as a loving, just being. Uh, that is, if, 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 if we all need uh, his uh, intervention in our life for any hope at salvation, which I think is what you know, uh, Mormon's sermon in, in Moroni 7 begins with for a reason, then how can we believe that any of that would work if he's going to cast off children simply because they're born in disadvantaged circumstances? So Mormon wants us to understand in that letter that we are born into different circumstances, but that we have a God who, 
who is good to all of his children and that he's not going to deprive anybody of the promise of salvation simply because of the accidents of birth. So again, it's this combination of a recognition of diversity and the universality of God's goodness. It's, the, it's, the, it's another variation on that leitmotif, on that consistent theme throughout this book. So I do think that there's something about the particularity of that issue that really animates uh, Mormon and undoubtedly, you know, in, in God's wisdom, he understands that there are going to be lots of elements of Christian doctrine that are going to run counter to that message. And therefore, there needs to be this, uh, this kind of countervailing force in, in Mormon's testimony. I have the sort of, maybe it's an idiosyncratic interpretation here, but I have this sense that partly why Moroni, now that this is different from why Mormon writes that letter, but why does Moroni include that letter? I mean, of all the things that Moroni could have included, why this screed against infant baptism? Uh, well, I have this theory that it's, it's a kind of warning against extremes, generally, not just the issue of infant baptism, but if you read in that chapter, more, the kind of culminating, concluding message of is don't rest too securely in dead works. Uh, that if you think you know, baptism is the only thing that saves and the absence of it is going to be you know, a guarantee of damnation, then that's too much. You're putting too much emphasis on dead works. And that's almost as if, to, as if Moroni is saying, okay, I laid the foundation with these ordinances. I talked about the importance of the rituals. Right, that they become the foundation around which you know the community of Christ has to coalesce, and that then becomes the foundation upon which these virtues of faith, hope, and charity are developed. So they're important, but don't overestimate their sufficiency. Don't believe that the ordinances in and of themselves are the key to salvation. And that seems to me kind of the overarching commitment of Moroni 8 and why Moroni included this particular letter from his father because it's a nice corrective to this emphasis on the ordinances that we've seen previously to say yes they're important but don't take that too far. So yes I think you know Mormon's clearly animated by the the particular concern of infant baptism but I think Moroni sees the value of a general uh, kind of warning about uh, a disproportionate emphasis on dead works as, you know, a key to salvation. So I think that's partly what's going on here as well. Yeah. Now, here's another question from the audience I think is interesting. It probably calls for a little bit of speculation, but that's okay. Uh, the question really relates to his role, meaning Moroni's role with Joseph Smith. Uh, the comment is, how does Moroni's life prepare him to be the messenger in referenced in Revelations 14, 6 through 7. That is, are the tests or events in his life, do they uniquely prepare him to have the knowledge and understand the challenges that Joseph would face that allows him to talk to Joseph through the obstacles involved in bringing forth the Book of Mormon? I mean, Moroni had to hide and protect the records all his life. Could he uniquely help and empathize with Joseph's difficulties to come in taking that same stewardship? I think so. Um, I, I've, I've alluded to my feelings on this already a little bit, which is that I, I think that part of what uh, Moroni has demonstrated over the course of his mortal ministry is a willingness to cede the spotlight to others. Uh, that is the willingness to do the hard work of ensuring that other people's words come to the attention of those who will benefit from them. And that's exactly what the Book of Mormon represents. It's exactly in the early stages of his ministry what Joseph was primarily called to do. Now, obviously, Joseph finds his own voice pretty quickly uh, and, and becomes the revelator um, that we know him to be. But Moroni is a kind of paragon of this principle that, um, that sometimes the greatest contribution that we have to make is as the carrier of other testimonies. Uh, and that's what he does at the end of the Book of Mormon. That's what he does at the end of the Book of Ether. That's what he does with the Book of Moroni. And that's what he does when he shows up with Joseph Smith. He starts quoting other 
prophets. And he's basically saying to this young translator, you're going to go through uh, a lot of trouble because of this volume. You're going to um, have to sacrifice a great deal to bring forth other people's words. You know, these aren't your words. You're merely the conduit. You're merely the conveyance of the testimonies of Nephi and Alma and Helaman. And you've got to be all right with that. You've got to be all right with laying it all on the line, not for your own voice to be heard, but to uplift and celebrate the testimonies of others. And who better to convey that message or to tutor a prophet in that process than Moroni, who had spent his whole ministry doing essentially the same thing. Yeah. Uh, another question, this comes from Moroni chapter seven, verse three. Uh, the question is, it speaks of two rests, the rest of the Lord and the rest with him in heaven. Can you provide some insight into what these two are, especially the rest of the Lord, as this appears to be something that can occur prior to resting in heaven? Yeah. Well, it, it, it goes back, I think, to the richness of the, of the principle of hope. That's, that's the virtue that precedes this uh, description of, uh, of the two rests or this reference to the two rests. Uh, and hope is this assurance that God's goodness is personally applicable. If you go throughout the Book of Mormon, hope, hope is not you know, kind, of, kind of a step toward faith, it, the way that we often use it in English. Right, that hope is a kind of watered down or preliminary kind of faith. That I don't know if I believe it's true, but I hope it's true. Um, there is one reference in Alma 32 that seems to kind of use it that way. But generally, hope is the personal application of the, of the substance of our faith. So if we believe that God keeps his covenants, hope is the belief that he'll keep it for me, that I have hope through that covenant. Um, that, that applies to David Holland. Uh, and um, the, uh, the, the rest here is the assurance that comes with that kind of hope, right? That when I have that hope, I have a kind of rest to my soul. My soul is otherwise somewhat restless. But when we know that those promises are personally applicable, there is a peace that passes all understanding that comes with that. I think that's that preliminary rest that hope provides the rest in the here and now, precisely because we have hope of the ultimate rest in the hereafter. Uh, and so, you know, both rests are uh, facilitated by that hope that is made possible through the atonement of Jesus Christ, that I am individually, not just in general terms, not there hasn't just been an atonement, but that I have been atoned for. Mm -hmm. And that's where the rest is ultimately found, both here and hereafter. Uh, another question that probably is a little bit of uh, speculation, but uh, the question is, is there a pattern that the Lord seems to be using of father and son historians or father and son prophets? There's a fair bit of that going on throughout the Book of Mormon, and obviously we see that with Mormon and Moroni. So the question is, what is your feeling on the pattern of fathers successfully teaching their sons, and why is this so prevalent in establishing truth? Well, I, 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 again, I, you know, one of the challenges with the Book of Mormon is that it's, uh, you know, we, we don't get other kinds of relationships. It's a pretty patriarchal book, uh, and, 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 you know, plates pass from father to son, uh, and I'm sure that's not the whole history. I'm sure we have other kinds of familial relationships, mothers to daughters, and uh, daughters to sisters and and things that you know, in, in a patriarchal time and place don't get included here. So I don't know that I would say that there's anything unique about the father to son relationship. I do think that there's something powerful about familial uh, connection. Um, you know, I, I, I've been struck by this study that um, that Emory University did a number of years ago on, on the resiliency of adolescence. Uh, and they, you know, this is a perfectly secular study it didn't have anything to do with the church, but the, the researchers identified a connection of intergenerational identity. That is the idea that an adolescent 
knows that they have a place in an intergenerational story, a sense of their own family history as critical to their psychological resilience, um, which obviously has particular meaning for Latter-day Saints. But I think what we see here, whether it's you know Jacob to Enos, which is a, a, a relationship of particular meaning to me, uh, or Mormon to Moroni, this sense that children grow up knowing that they're part of something bigger than themselves, knowing that they're a link in a chain that began before them and will continue after them. Uh, and so I don't know that it's anything in the particularity of father to son conveyance, but something in this um, commitment to making sure that children know that they are part of something that transcends themselves. That might seem counterintuitive or paradoxical, but that that is the source of real identity. That is the source of real empowerment is if you know that you are part of something that began before you and will continue after you and that you have a role to play in its perpetuation. Uh, and so I think we see that it happens to be father to son uh, relationships here, but I think the, the larger principle is much larger than that. Yeah. Now, we touched earlier on the gifts of the spirit in Moroni chapter 10. There are a couple questions that it seems want to dig into that a little bit deeper and reference the fact that it's, uh, an in, in intertextual quote uh, to other of what we today call the standard works. Um, so the question is considering your background and research, how do you approach and what do you have to teach about spiritual gifts in your book? And then the, the follow-up questions, does it coincide with what you teach as a lay leader and in what ways does it differ? Well, I, I mean, I, th I think that this is a found, sound very simplistic, but it is, for me, the most important part of Moroni's testimony and Mormon's testimony, which is simply that they exist, that those spiritual gifts are real. Uh, and I do believe in that. I mean, I've, I've seen them manifest in some pretty remarkable ways in my life. Uh, and I believe uh, in their continuation. So, um, you know, if we go back to, to Moroni 7 and, you know, Mormon saying, you know, if, if you don't believe in these miracles, you're in pretty rough shape because without these, I mean, th this is the easy stuff. Right? I mean, it used to be, I guess there's a sense in which, you know, it's easy to say you believe in the atonement of Jesus Christ, but it's a little bit harder to say that you believe in the speaking of tongues. And Mormon's saying, you know, speaking in tongues is small change, right? That's the simple stuff. If you can't believe in that, how are you ever going to believe in the atonement of Jesus Christ? Uh, and so... You know, as if, you know, the, the atonement is the easy thing to swallow uh, and, and the gifts of prophecy are harder. Um, in fact, uh, you know, it, faith in one is, is sort of uh, in some ways uh, indispensable um, in, in faith in the bigger thing. Right? Once you believe Christ can forgive your sins, the moving of mountains is a relatively simple proposition. So we have to believe that it is, uh, that it is here, uh, that they are present, that they are possible, that God is a giver of gifts, that they are diversely distributed, and that they will manifest themselves in, in ways and among people that we might not ex expect. That in that belief, there is a whole wealth of theology that is critical to everything else that we believe. And so that's what I teach as a lay leader. I serve as the president of uh, now a newly formed state, the Worcester, Massachusetts state. Uh, and, and I hope that I am cultivating faith in a God of gifts and the spiritual gifts that are described in just about every book of our standard works. Uh, you know, when, when they're repeated across, uh, across volumes, that should be a, a pretty strong message to us of their centrality and the importance of our conviction in them. Well, in the last couple minutes that we have, um, let me ask one final question for you. You've probably spent more time over the last year thinking about and studying Moroni than most of us have in a lifetime. But I'm curious, what surprised you most as you really dug into this and, and learned about Moroni and, and understood you know, from a different perspective his story, his message? What, what were you most surprised by? <laughs> 
I, I think the thing that I've come to appreciate most about Moroni that I don't know that I f fully appreciated before, and I, in that sense, a bit of a surprise, uh, is, is his meekness, his humility. Um, you know, he, he doesn't always come off as a particularly meek figure. Uh, you know, at the very end of the book, he prophesies his own <laughs> exaltation. You know, that he's, he's rising triumphantly to meet us in the air, you know, to, to hold us accountable before the bar of God. That's a pretty bold declaration. And that's kind of the Moroni that I always had in the back of my mind, uh, or the, you know, the Moroni of the, of the Freeburg uh, paintings, uh, you know, that, that looks, you know, like a bodybuilder. Uh, but what the Moroni that I find here, uh, having lived with him uh, for a while now, is somebody who understands the power of true humility. You know, this recurring recognition of his own inadequacy, this sense of uh, existential dependence on the Lord for everything, that his, his very existence is a gift, that the air he breathes is a gift. None of them the creation of his own capacity, but all of them conferred upon him an unworthy servant by a magnanimous God. Uh, and this idea that he's well aware of this gap that we all live with between who we are and who we hope to be. We all live with that gap. It is the one universal truth of human existence. Uh, but what Moroni also understands is that God's power is to be met in that gap. That gap is there by divine design uh, because it is an opportunity for the full grace and goodness of our Father to be made manifest. And so it's that part of Moroni's character, that part of his prophetic approach uh, that has touched me most deeply and that will leave, I think, the most lasting impression on my own soul. Uh, so I'm grateful to have encountered that part of him. And I think you have to live with him a while before that aspect of his character becomes fully apparent. Yeah. Well, thank you, David. We appreciate you taking the time this evening to share your thoughts and your insights with us. We appreciate you taking the time and effort to write this volume. And we'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening and for your participation and thoughtful questions. Uh, so that you know, a replay of this session will be available on the Witso Foundation YouTube channel later this week, if there are others that uh, were not able to participate tonight that uh, would like to see it. Uh, we're, of course, most appreciative for a collaboration with the Maxwell Institute on this Amontning series. And we are hopeful that you've been inspired like we have by the in insights from the scholars we've had the privilege of speaking with, who've authored the volumes on this Theology of the Book of Mormon series. We hope that you have a wonderful holiday season. We invite you to join with us on January 17th as we kick off a new series on church history with the former managing director of the church history department, Richard Turley. Again, thanks to all of you for being here tonight for your participation. Uh, good night, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you again in the new year.